So why free body diagrams? Um, it's basically answering the question, how does the load get into a structural component and how does it get out? And when you're trying to set up an FEA a simulation, you might not be able to create a free body diagram necessarily from scratch, but it's very, very useful to understand how that load gets in, how a load gets out, and really to therefore to understand the load path. And I think that's the important thing. What is the load path? I was always kind of blown away when I was a young uh, stress engineer. Um, the experienced stressman, hand stressman, they never heard of FEA, didn't use any kind of tools like that. They could look at a structure, come up with these free body, free body diagrams, and really understand what that load path was doing, and then how to apply uh, detail uh, hand stressing type approaches. I struggle to, to come up to that kind of level, as I will mention. I think it's a bit of a, a, an art rather than a, a science. It's just uh, something you're able to do or, or easily, or you've got to work at it. So a free body diagram is a picture that shows all the external balancing loads acting on a component. What it doesn't show is all the internal uh, forces and so on. It, it basically says this is the, the external balancing set, so known as the free body diagram. It uh, includes a set of applied loads uh, or forces and then reaction forces. And it, it's used to check that all the forces are in balance, um, but also probably more uh, importantly uh, to get um, our understanding of that internal load path. This is um, the key to a free body diagram is, is equilibrium. So basically in 2D representation, like in an XY plane that we've got here, we've just got a simple beam, it's a cantilever beam. We're going to summate all the forces in the X direction. And in fact, here there's no axial loads and no axial reaction. So their summation is zero. We summate um, the forces in the Y direction. And here's obviously the vertical force here. And that's going to balance us to a shear value at the end there. And then a moment, well, there we can pick whatever point we like. And that's part of the art. You just say, well, pick a moment, say here. And then we can do the moment balance. And here, fully, you would have three equations, three unknowns. In our particular case, we've just got two equations and two unknowns, the unknowns being the shear force and the batting moment to the root here. Now, that's, that's pretty straightforward. Um, and you've probably all done that kind of thing at college. It's a bit tedious, but uh, not too bad. Um, and then we get, uh, as we move further on from your college days, we're using equilibrium to find all the forces. That's OK. That's pretty straightforward. But if we've got redundant load paths, in other words, statically indeterminate structures, then we, we, can't, we can't do that. So we wouldn't really dive into a general kind of structure and say, let's do the free body diagram by hand to check what's going on in the FEA analysis. It's more we'd um, kind of apply the loads, probably use FEA to get the reactions out, and then look to see what we've got is often the approach I would take there. Um, because it's statically indeterminate, we've got to start using energy methods. So for example, the, the middle diagram here, um, there's one redundancy, that prop support. So we can use method of cuts, Castellanos theorem, all sorts of different methods. Basically, um, because it's an energy method, what's interesting is the stiffness of that support prop is going to govern how much reaction force goes through there. If it's infinitely stiff, there's a certain amount, that's a standard equation. And then we can have a spring in there, which we could gradually soften. Imagine softening all the way down to so it doesn't exist. So we're controlling the amount of load that comes out of that prop there. We go to the bottom diagram, then uh, we're also controlling the amount of moment that comes out. So these things, um, the one in the middle, yes, I could still remember how to do that. The one on the bottom, two redundancies, it's getting really tedious to solve, and we just don't do that. Um, we would use FEA to do that, or that a simple, simple case like that. I could look up Rourke's formula for stress and strain, and that's got a standard solution for that. So basically, um, we're not probably going to be able to create the free body diagram from scratch, as we would do, say, on a, a college course, but we're going to be reviewing, let's say, the results of a free body diagram. So um, if we look here, what I've done is to run this analysis. Um, it's got support points in red, reaction points in red, applied load in, in black. And I'm using the free body diagram tools in the FEA program. There's something I really encourage you to do. It's way too complicated to do this by hand. Um, to be honest, some of the FEA programs, it's tough to get the free body diagram out. You've got to figure out the workflow. But I really would recommend that you figure that out and come up with a diagram like this. I do like to see this kind of um, diagram in a report just so we can see what's going on. And we can kind of observe this and say, well, this would be, for example, bolt load pickup points. 
And I can see I've got a couple going on here because I've got a little bit of an offset in here. There's a horizontal component load which is giving a couple uh, on top of the um, equal um, equal balance uh, that we get otherwise. So you can kind of read all sorts of things into this. As a designer, you can start to think, well, maybe I can control the directions or the, the distribution of this load. Remembering that the stiffness attracts load, so if I can change the stiffness, I can change the, the reaction going through there. So 3D, um, we've got six equations. Uh, so summations, again, the translations, the, trans uh, the rotations, again, uh, way too complicated really in practice to do by hand. Um, although uh, certainly detailed stressmen and back in the day, I would have to do something like this by hand. You have to simplify and so on. Uh, I wouldn't, it's like everything else. It's like uh, you do your apprenticeship and you think, well, I never want to do that task again. You know, like uh, um, uh, dressing out something by hand, um, planing something by hand and so on. You don't want to do that, but it teaches you what, what engineering is all about. Same kind of idea here. Now, the general definition of, uh, so is it an action or reaction um, is basically um, what one of the, the issues. Free body diagrams, in my view, are not easy. I've had a couple of people already. I wrote an article for a digital engineering magazine, taken a lot of that uh, in here, and you reused it. A lot of, uh, well, a few people were saying, well, what's your problem? It's dead easy. I don't think so. I think free body diagrams to, to set up and interpret are actually quite tough. And one of them is, is it a reaction force or is it an applied force? It can be a little bit debatable uh, in the general sense. Do we think of that as an action or a reaction? That's going to control the way we think about a free body diagram. So it can be a bit debatable. In an FEA model definition, it becomes clearer because you've just decided what you're going to do. You're going to say, well, the actions are the forces I'm going to apply. The reactions are my constraints. So you've already segregated these into an action and reaction. In a way, that's a little bit arbitrary, and I kind of go through that. So why the confusion? Well, a true free body diagram is a bit more philosophical. Um, is it an action reaction? It's up to us to decide what we want to call it there. It's really not interested in so much in actions. And reaction is just defining the fundamental nature of the load path uh, through the component. And I think that is one of the areas that I certainly kind of struggle with. So here's some examples. I've got a, um, a conrod here. So I've got the little end and the big end. And I can either view this just looking at the top row now. I can use this and say, well, there's the action coming through from the crank, and it's reacted at the, at the little end. Or I can view it, and, and why would the little end think it's a reaction and the big end think it's an action? It's, that's why I say it's philosophical. We can then say, well, the little end sees the load, and the crank is reacting it. Or we can say, well, they both see the load, and then the load path is, is down through the structure. So the top row is it's philosophical. It's up to you how you describe it. By the way, the little cross through there is the old way that we always uh, kind of said action and reaction. It's kind of handy to kind of do that. You come to FEA, and then there's some very big implications. So the bottom row here, it's like, OK, condition A and condition B. I've decided that my reaction is going to be the little end and the big end. Um, and uh, that's, what, that's the way we approach it. <laughs> I'm getting comments popping up as we go through, and it's kind of fun. Um, Somebody just said, ah, my head's hurting already. I know what you mean. Um, the one uh, in the middle, uh, sorry, the one on the bottom right is the one I actually like to, to uh, load up. Uh, there's a method called the 3 2, 1 method or the minimum constraint method. Well, why prescribe constraints? Let's think of everything as actions. And if I can, that's the way I like to do uh, FE analysis. That could be perhaps the topic of another conversation. So the FEA implications, very big deal on the bottom row there. So again, is it an action reaction is, is another issue that we have to face when we come to free body diagrams. And then we've also got sign conventions. Here's my Conrod again. I can have a natural load sign convention saying, well, this is the compressive stroke, let's say, let's say like the, um, uh, the compression stroke, and we are squeezing. Um, so we get a nice compression in here. And I look at that and say, well, there's going to be reaction here, reaction here, or, or applied load here and applied load here and it is in compression, I'm going to write this in the natural state. So my sign convention is just going to be F1 equals F2. Or I can say, let's take a more kind of a rigorous approach. Uh, to the right is positive. So then basically F2 becomes like a, you know, actual becomes a negative value. So F1 plus F2 equals zero. The force direction isn't assumed, and so we'll apply a sign value to that and become a negative force there. By the time you've done that, 
and you think about action and reactions, this is where we start to get into this kind of little bit of mix up. And uh, I have to often uh, kind of do these things two or three times. Maybe it's just me. Maybe everybody else there is saying, well, what's your problem, Tony? Why do you get into this model? But this is some of the issues. Now, whoops, the Conrod just, just see axial loads, compression and tension, which would be nice. Unfortunately, Conrod see bending. Uh, and that uh, is not just due to somebody, say, driving through a Ford, getting water into the, uh, into the piston, and then you get a tremendous compressive load, which would get a buckling force. You actually get inertia loads coming in. So, so where do the uh, off-axis loads come from? We've got to draw an, uh, an acceleration or inertia diagram. These are accelerations being applied to the Conrod. So uh, from the CG point of view, we have a, a linear acceleration running this way acceleration running that way. We've got um, an angular acceleration and also centrifugal loading. That lot as acceleration added to our normal free body diagram gives us now uh, F1 and F2 are, that can be an oblique angle. It doesn't be acting through the center line here. And equally here, F3 and F4, by definition, we've got F3, which is now a force which is um, normal to the axial direction. So that's going to give us the bending. So it's not a very nice full body diagram to do. And I must admit, I spent about three days trying to work through this. Um, Merriam um, Mechanics Part 2 Dynamics, there's a page reference in there. If anybody's interested, I can kind of pull that out again later. That I slog through. And it's like, whenever you get like a, a definitive uh, work through there, then it's fantastic because I can just follow that. It's tough. So inertia loads, again, can be very important in many cases overlay them on free body diagrams. And it's our, our easy uh, challenge of free body diagram is, is looking not quite so easy. So a couple of examples from my, um, from my own career. Um, this um, is very early days uh, as, a, as a stressman. I was sitting opposite uh, a good friend of mine and an excellent stress guy who's, who's been at it for probably about 15 years. His, uh, his challenge was it was a control circuit in um, it was an early Western helicopter. Uh, this isn't exactly the right helicopter, but same kind of idea. And his case was two pilots disagreeing. So here's the control uh, pedals. Uh, it's not uh, a rudder as such. It's uh, it's a directional control, but we loosely call it the rudder. So here there's actually a gust lock on this one. But imagine two a rudder pedal here, rudder pedal here, and one pilot decides he wants to go one way. So a big boot comes up in that direction. And the other pilot decides he wants to go the other way, so a big boot comes up in that direction. And basically, uh, you then put a control load into that circuit. And that's a critical case when two pilots disagree. I forget what the formal specification is. We can call it the pilot disagreement uh, load case there. So basically, um, the error in was uh, pilot A inputs 200 pound force, pilot B in inputs 200 pound force. And what Nick said right at the beginning of his stress analysis was, Let's put 400 pounds in the system, so in the cabling, <clears throat> in the control run. And um, that basically doubles the load up. Because if we look at this, this is my two men on a rope uh, uh, analogy here. Here's a guy pulling, in this particular case, 200 pounds force. That's how much it weighs. He weighs 200 pounds force. What is the, the uh, axial load in the rope running around here? It's 200 pound force. We actually, when uh, what Nick did was he found this error right at the end of his calculations. He spent about four or five weeks going through the con complete control circuit, lots of pulleys, lots of wiring, lots of uh, push rods. And then he found he doubled the load all the way through. And so um, all the little detail, the push rods, pull rods, brackets, fittings, and so on, he, he'd been muttering and cursing all the way through that this designers, these aren't really, these guys aren't really good. The reserve factors are low, and he had to get into all sort of fiddle factors and so on to try and push it up, and then some recommendations and so on. So he was very suspicious. Well, not suspicious. It was kind of, it was just not very good design. And the reason was we'd put double, he'd put double the load in. So that's why the reserve factors were low everywhere. He collapsed head down on the desk at that point because basically he suddenly realized all his work was junk. All the carefully argued uh, cases, uh, form factors, a little bit of plasticity and so on, all had to be stripped away, start again from scratch, and then basically rework it with 200 pound force going through the system. We called him for about um, two or three months afterwards, we called him two men on a rope, Nick. That was um, because we, we just said, okay, let's think about this, it's two men on a rope. 
Now, somebody pulled me up on this um, the other day and said, well, there is a load of um, 400 pounds, and it is a reaction force through the pulley. So I hadn't completely finished this diagram, so I will do that now. The reaction force, if we look at these as all external forces, is 400 pound force. And me leaving that off um, is, is a classic little trap that I fell into there. So that's that was a trap. Very, very experienced dressman. Just a quick snappy catch, 200 pound in, 200 pound in, 400 pound in the system. And you can see that's the kind of issue that we're talking about there. So that was a bit of a fun one. Um, that was a long, long time ago. But I always remember that. If you're that experienced and that clever, you can still fall into that easy trap. So that's the end of a detailed stressing analysis. So in the same way, um, when we looked at that pre-body diagram of the, uh, of the FE analysis, it's useful to look at that very early on to say, did I mean the simulation there to pump out reactions there or to pump out reactions there? The same way we talked yesterday, uh, last week, sorry, about sanity checks. We can use this as a sanity check. There's a free body diagram. Is that the right design intent? Is that the right physics coming out? So I think they serve many purposes, um, and it really is, is a great way to figure out what's going on. But they are, they are tough. <clears throat> uh, kind of um, go into this example is the Kansas City example. This was a real tragedy. Um, it happened, I think it was 1981. So actually, ironically, it was um, just about three years after Nick did his two men on a rope thing. So this was uh, late 70s, so early 80s. This was a, a classic example. Now, these um, walkways obviously shouldn't be down here on the ground. They started as suspended walkways. That's a ligament running up there. It's a, a rod up there that's come down with it. So basically, um, there was a dance. And the, uh, the investigation showed that there wasn't really that many people. It wasn't like it was, um, I guess it wasn't uh, like a, I don't know, a Rod Stewart concert or something, which was absolutely packing people out. There was just a scattering, really, a sprinkle of people around here. The main dance was on the floor down in here. This walkway connected uh, rooms, connected elevators, and so on. But the key thing was that the walkway suspended by threaded tie rods retained by nuts. So they failed, and a lot of people were killed at that particular point. So what we're going to look at is why they failed. And they failed because of a misunderstanding of the free body diagram. Now, the original uh, design was to have um, just, uh, this is a walkway, it's a bottom walkway. It has a certain mass times acceleration. Here's the next walkway up, certain mass times acceleration. And just looking at an overall free body diagram, obviously, uh, the rods coming out of that is the total weight is supported and split between the two rods here. Now, I simplified it as a planar diagram. It's obviously going to be a 3D diagram, but that's just, just the way we're going to do it. So basically, uh, half the load uh, comes up here, half the load comes up here. So basically, the load in the rod is getting uh, accumulated. We have M2 times G over 2 here. And then added to that is M2, M1, G over 2. So basically, that much, only, the bottom rods are only supporting the, the bottom uh, walkway. And then the top rod sections is supporting both walkways. So there is a doubling of the load, but it's basically um, occurring uh, in the accident in the rod. The nut supporting here and the nut supporting here just carry the, the same load. It's evenly distributed um, between them. So this was the original design intent. The trouble was you've got to have a long thread running down through here, and you've got to have a nut which is going to be winding up. If I go back to the diagram here, you can see the height of that rod. And so that's going to be an awful long thread just to, um, to, to wind that nut on. So the design uh, changed. Um, and this is just uh, kind of explaining how, the, again, the nut is picking up the, um, the load on the original design. So just kind of confirming what I've done is to say, imagine that load is just uh, split to say that face and that face of the nut, just a way of illustrating it. So we can agree there that the if the mass of the two walkways is the same, the load's going to be the same on the nut there. And that, that was just a simple assumption in there. So the load is, is um, this picks up the load due to that, um, that walkway. This picks up the load due to that walkway. And we could call it like a passing load from the bottom walkway passes through this, this rod up into the, to the main support there. So um, the load on the, each nut is, is equal. Uh, and that's basically what, what we're doing there. 
Now, I've got to say, it took me um, to get this right and double check and double check. It took me a couple of hours. It's actually very straightforward. And at the end, I'll just show that little cartoon at the end. It's actually conceptually, it's a very simple idea. But we can get bogged down in all the other complications that are going on. Now, the, the um, initial uh, installed assembly, what was actually put in, deviated from the design because they basically said it's not practical to thread the rod all the way through. If we split it like this, then I can thread that end of the rod, that end of the rod, this end of the rod. And then from that point of view, from the actual assembler point of view, and I guess the, the manufacturing point of view, it's a lot easier. So this is what they did. They decided the single rod concept wasn't practical. Um, so this is the approach. So it, on the face of the free external free body diagram, you know, what's changed? Big deal. We're applying uh, the load from the bottom walkway, the top walkway. It's pumping out in the end through this rod here and this rod here. If we compare back to the previous free body diagram, externally, somewhat similar kind of load path. I think this is probably what happened. Somebody looked at that external load path uh, free body diagram and thought, well, there's really uh, not much change in there. First glance, the, the free body diagram seemed to show very low, similar load path. The walkway loading is accumulated. Uh, this has the bottom load. Uh, this has the bottom load plus the top load. But um, the only obvious difference is the offset moment. We've got a kick moment coming in here. Now, we were always taught in uh, aircraft stress work and design work, kick moments are the devils in the detail. And if you do this, then we've got a local moment being introduced here. Now, when I first looked at that um, literature, I thought, well, yeah, they've introduced that offset moment, and that's going to hammer that structure locally. And I'm going to do an FE analysis. I'll show you the results of that. Uh, and it shows that, yes, the bending moments are very, very important. But they're actually secondary. Then they're not um, the, the deciding factor. So um, it's a secondary factor. So in the free body diagram as shown here, and also in the report free body diagram, and lots of people have echoed this, we're actually going to ignore the little kick moments. And again, I want to emphasize that's just really because people decided this is the important thing for clarity that's been ignored. If I did this in a stress report and ignored the kick moments, then I would get kicked in a different way. So um, again, trying to simplify what's going on, if the kick moments are there, but they're not um, not, not so important. If we look at the, the joint free body diagrams, and this is a key thing, this is a free body diagram, not of the overall structure, free body diagram, and it's like a compound free body diagram showing the joint reactions. And this is the free body diagram that was really not included in the discussion. If we look at this, the bottom walkway, and we're just looking at one nut is being uh, the nut is carrying the load and then transferring into the rod and equally that uh, load is being uh, carried up and then rod reacting through down there putting that load into the upper walkway so the upper walkway is um, already had the load coming from the bottom walkway and then so the nut here has to carry the bottom walkway load plus the upper walkway load so basically it doubles the load in the nut and so that, we can look at it different ways. That's the total reaction as we know we've accumulated that. That has to be reacted by one nut. So to put that in balance, by definition, we've got to double the load in the nut. This is what was missed in the free body diagram or there was no evidence of a, of a, log, uh, of a component free body diagram. So this point seemed to be missed. Uh, and in fact, it, the tragedy was that um, the reserve factor or the margin of safety on the original design, the straight through, wasn't sufficient um, to to deal with a factor of two. So it was already, I think, a factor that worked out about 1.2. So you take 1.2 as your safety factor, double your loads, and then it is basically is doomed because of that. So it really was a very sloppy piece of design. I wouldn't, you know, I'd never like to point a finger because. Everybody can make these kind of mistakes. So, um, but it's something again we can benefit from seeing. This was put in practice, and this is basically, yeah. You know, somebody says kaplunk, there we go, um, failure. Um, so I've taken a picture and I'm just trying to kind of give a, a more detailed diagram or a clearer diagram of what's going on. This is the the free body diagram we've seen. This is the rod pulling down. So that's still extant. That's still there. The rod's the lower walkway. The rod to the next walkway up has basically burst through here. So it was actually not a failure um, of the material as such, continuous material. 
to compound it, there was actually a seam weld in here right through where that fail failure is. And there was no blanking plate or there was no reinforcing plate welded on top. So you've got double the load acting right on something which is a, a, a seam weld. And this is prone to buckling as well. So it is, really is an awful design, just ripped through completely through here. And that was the, that was the result of it. So it, you can say there are other compounding issues, but basically uh, it was fundamentally a misunderstanding of this doubling of the nut in here. So I think this is probably the key thing highlighted in red here, a failure to look at a local free body diagram and figure out what was going on there. So um, that was the issue there. I did an FE analysis model of that, and I wanted to show, um, could I, can I kind of replicate that? So rather than using um, uh, box beams, I use channels just for um, quick and easy kind of modeling. I've shortened the rods because they're obviously very long rods, and that means a lot of mesh there just to carry it. Um, I've guided one side here. I've just put that on uh, constraints which don't allow rotation. So then again, I don't have to model the rest of the structure. Uh, what else have I done? Instead of putting uh, a load in, I put a pressure distribution which equates to the load coming in there. Um, the upper rod is fixed at the top end in here. And I use what's called linear contact. Linear contact is a um, it's basically a small scale contact. We're just looking at uh, the solver will partition those regions which can only have contact make or break. There can be no other general nonlinearity. So it's a cheap and quick way of running uh, uh, a contact. It's called uh, uh, linear, but in fact, behind the scenes, there's usually five or six iterations to quickly get to you to what's well, usually a fairly uh, easy convergence to achieve. So that's the setup. Um, and this is the result that comes out. This is just showing the mesh. This is showing the, the displacement. So I just wanted to get a feel for Obviously, the bulging is in the right place. This is bulging up, that's bulging down, and so on. But we can also see there's bending coming this way very clearly, and there's also bending going the other way. Now, the bending this way is just because of the fact we are bending up in here. But we're also getting bending between there. This is the offset moment that I was talking about. So it's actually quite complicated. I wanted to look and, and try and understand. Um, OK, I can see the load pounds probably from the free body diagram. You know, what are the stresses telling me? And what I found, and I make the conclusion, is that the FE analysis in many ways gets in the way because there's too much information going on there. I didn't try and simulate the buckling uh, of the failure mode in here, uh, in this, this rupture here. I, and I didn't try and represent the world line of the rupture. We're just trying to see, could I see clearly from the FE analysis what's going on? So here, I'm looking at the von Mises stress. And uh, again, I've been brutal with the contours here. I like to control the contours. I wanted to see if the stress is double in the region here compared to here, which means the nut reaction forces and everything, the bearing forces are double as well. Lo and behold, there's 10,000 noted there, and there's 5,000 noted there. And the colors kind of show the, the, the result. Now, it took probably, again, about an hour rummaging through the post-processor to try and identify very clearly what's going on. The stress is all over the place due to the doubling load on the nut, but also due to the offset kick moment, and also stresses coming this way. So a lot of stresses going on. Longitudinal stresses, I just wanted to show the bending stress running through here. And again, there's a stress concentration factor coming in there. Stress concentration factor here is double stress concentration factor there. So it's all kind of convincing me what's going on. Also, von Mises stresses, I don't know if it's compression or tension. I whipped around look at the top surface, the bottom surface, just to convince myself what's going on there, to try and, uh, if you like, um, see the, uh, the, sometimes we have the English phrase, I can't see the wood for the trees. Um, basically, there's so much stress distribution, very complicated. Uh, with the help of the free body diagram, that guided me on how to figure out how to plot these stresses so I could actually see what's going on. I also did a comparison, and this is a straight through, um, and this is the straight through design. Same stress level here, same stress level here. So uh, I always kind of thought back to myself, if I'd just seen this FE analysis, um, I hadn't done a free body diagram, and obviously hadn't had the benefit of hindsight, would I necessarily have picked up that fact that the reaction forces doubled up in here underneath the nut because of all the stresses which are going on there? And that's, I don't honestly know the answer to that question. Here I'm coming with the benefit of hindsight. Um, a good detailed stressman would have picked it up straight away. I might have got so 
um, overwhelmed by the, the complexity of the stress pattern, I might not have seen it. This to me is the most compelling, comparing this to the previous one, and then I, even I could figure out, okay, there's something different going on in here. So uh, the Kansas City final design, that free body diagram is tricky. The resultant node path definition is tricky. I find with free body diagrams, it's like a lot of things. Um, I'm good at anagrams in crossword puzzles for some bizarre reason. I can see the anagrams pretty well straight away. Um, other people just look at me blank, say, well, how did you see that? I think free body diagrams are much, much the same kind of thing. Um, you either get them straight away or you've got to work at them. If you the majority of people like me, you've got to work at them. And you probably get through three or four different uh, pages or sketches and so on to kind of figure out what's going on there. The FAA result almost gives away too much information. As I'm just kind of recapping, it took me a long time to figure out the best way to plot the stresses, even though I know what the conclusion was. And that's often the case, I find, when looking at stresses coming out of an FAA analysis, I've got to figure out, I've got to control them. I've got to control the legend, control the components to get an understanding of what on earth these stresses are trying to tell me. Basically, the stresses are following the load path by definition. So if I understand the load path, I understand how the stresses got there, why the stresses are there. So the bending and duty offset between the rods dominates, uh, and the result stress competition is complicated. I won't say it's the most dominating factor, but it, it really does play a role there. It wasn't mentioned in the report, um, and it perhaps should have been done, but it was a compounding effect. The, the basic point was the doubling up of the load on, on the nuts, but basically it took a little while to do that. So as I mentioned, the clearest indication was comparing the straight through design with the offset design. Uh, the end off hand calculations ignore the bending effect, but in some ways, again, if you're doing a, a free body diagram, you say I'm deliberately avoiding that kick moment to understand more clearly what's going on. Again, uh, that, that's useful kind of practice. So uh, having set all that up, I had this correspondence. David Botos sent me uh, an email, uh, I think a couple of days ago now. And he said, well, this is like uh, somebody climbing up on a rope. You've got a guy climbing up on the rope here. He's carrying his own load. Um, and so he's seeing the pain of his own weight. The guy beneath him is also seeing the pain of his own weight, muscles and arms and legs and so on, under stress. The rope sees his weight at the bottom, and then here the rope sees double the load. But we haven't got that guy up the top there in some difficulty because um, the loads are doubling up. We changed the design, and this is the analogy. Now, this was two men on a rope, so it's uh, kind of, again, another uh, extension to the cartoon, Nick's cartoon, two men on a rope. So going around a pulley, there they are, and the load in the middle there is going to be um, the same uh, load between this guy and this guy. We're going to get, let's say, uh, 200 pounds. He weighs 200 pounds. 200 pound goes in there. Um, that's the essence of that diagram. This diagram, we've got two ropes. So now that rope runs out, and it's connected around this guy's waist. That top, guy, uh, that top rope stops. So what does the guy, you can imagine the pain there, this guy not only sees his own weight, but he sees the weight of this guy hanging down below there. And that's exactly the analogy that we have with the Kansas City doubling the load on those nuts. I think this one is pretty easy to understand and look at. And that's the difficulty of getting from the, all the complexity, of the detail, the complex stresses and so on, and be able to uh, absolutely um, identify what's going on there. Um, so that, that would be my recommendation there to think very clearly uh, what's going on there. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, a glass of wine really helped with the, the cartoon sketch there. Um, if anybody wants it, by the way, I'm more than happy to send them uh, uh, the, the image there. It's kind of fun to create it. So thank you very much for watching. Uh, uh, as usual, I've already run a little bit. Um, the, uh, I'll clean up the, 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 uh, the video. We'll post it on YouTube and our respective websites. Uh, so look out for the link, which will be coming uh, shortly. Next session is next Friday, April the 24th. And we dive into probably what... <laughs> I don't know how many people are going to tune into this one, David. It's probably everybody's uh, pet hate subject, more circle. It's a very dry theoretical thing. Everybody hates the theory. Is it relevant today? And I, I think it is, but uh, I, again, I, I'm, I will put forward this, this proposition. So I think at that point, I've just got... Um, that's my last slide. I've just got some work areas here. So I'll hand over to you, David, to, to wrap up, uh, to, to take us into the Q&A.